Um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to uh, this very interesting workshop. Um, my talk would be more on um, application uh, side of uh, this workshop, um, more specifically application in neuroscience. Uh, but along the way, I'm going to talk about, so this is our AIM-3, um, um, but um, along the way, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, statistical modeling, which is shown as AIM-1 here, and AIM-2 of our project, defined as uh, developing computationally efficient methods to solve this problem. So, um, more specifically, the application that we are interested in is uh, sequence memory task in rats. So, we, um, so our collaborator designed um, this experiment and the idea was to understand the uh, um, underlying neural mechanisms um, of uh, memory for sequence of events. So in this case, rat is basically uh, learning uh, a sequence of orders that is presented to it. Um, and, and then based on this experiment, this is the data uh, that uh, uh, were collected, and this is the data that I'm going to discuss today. So the data um, is multimodal uh, data. It involves some uh, continuous time series, which is called uh, local field potential LFP. And um, so these are shown on the top. And, um, and there are some discrete time series. These are the firing patterns of neurons. So two modalities here, um, mainly. But, um, and the idea is to understand neural mechanisms of memory for sequence of events. Um, and the events are shown here. Order A, B, C, D, E are presented uh, in a sequence. So when we started working on this uh, problem and a uh, problem like this, we developed uh, a Bayesian and stochastic process uh, model. Um, more specifically, we use Gaussian processes uh, to model the, uh, the firing uh, rate of uh, each neuron over time. And um, so this was a univariate Gaussian processes, shows that this neuron starts firing more, and then it dies out, it becomes silent over time. And then we use a copula to, uh, to model the joint distribution um, from multiple neurons. Um, later, we moved to directly using multivariate uh, Gaussian processes to model multiple neurons jointly. Um, so in this case here, I'm just showing two uh, Gaussian processes that they, uh, they're anti-correlated. One goes up, the other one goes down. And because these type of problems are very computationally intensive, this is a, a Bayesian model. Um, we need to use uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm to uh, sample from the posterior distribution and approximate it. Um, more specifically, we have been using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm, which is a, a specific uh, metropolis algorithm. And um, um, it's very efficient. I'm going to show you some example later on. It's more efficient as, uh, than the usual random walk metropolis that people have been using, uh, but it involves solving this system of differential equations, and which usually cannot be solved analytically, so people have been using some numerical approximation uh, for solving them. Okay. Um, so um, that's been uh, the work we have been doing over the past uh, couple of years. More recently, in collaboration with Professor Baldi, um, we have uh, started uh, using deep learning because part of this project involves prediction, which they call it decoding. So basically, if I show you, if I remove these labels and I show you these neural activities for the continuous and the for the discrete time series, can you tell me like what colors were presented to RAT? So this is called decoding. So it's a prediction problem, so it makes sense for us to explore the possibility of using deep learning, and that's the main part of this talk today. Um, however, um, the connection between Gaussian processes that we have been working on and, and neural networks, um, it was discussed in the, uh, previously. This is uh, by Radford Neal, who was my PhD advisor. So uh, he published a book on that. And then more recently, people have been basically showing the connection between Gaussian processes and deep learning uh, <laughs> methods. So, um, so it's not that disconnected, uh, going from Bayesian and stochastic process 
models to deep learning. So uh, we want to use uh, deep learning for the prediction task, but also we have been uh, exploring the possibility of using uh, deep learning and neural network um, for the computation, for the inference part. When I say inference, I mean basically estimating the parameter, getting the posterior distribution. So that's the background. Um, now, the outline of this talk would be that I will discuss uh, uh, the experiment very briefly because I think it's a very interesting experiment. Um, and then I'll show some of the existing methods that we have been using um, and then uh, some preliminary results based on deep learning and then there would be conclusion and future directions. So the experiment uh, is focusing on hippocampus which is known to be central to memory for sequences of events but again as I said the underlying neural mechanism is not uh, fully known so to address this issue uh, our collaborators they have been collecting data uh, from, C from the CA1 region um, for rats that they were performing non-spatial um, sequential memory tasks. So it's very important that this is very different than the usual um, uh, uh, experiments that people have been designing where a rat uh, moves in the maze and does different things. Um, this one, the rat basically stands in the same place and the focus is on uh, memorizing a sequence. So. Uh, the hope is that this would have more connection to what we do as human beings. You guys are sitting here listening to the talk, you sit, read a book, you sit, you know, like you're in the same place watching a movie. You are not moving around. For many of our tasks, we're basically in the same place. It's non-spatial, most of our tasks. So the idea was that if we can design it, it's very difficult to design this, but if we can design that we are successful, there is a better connection to what we do as human beings um, and understanding memory uh, in human beings. So the task itself involved presenting a sequence of orders um, at a single port, so the rat basically stays uh, in the same place. And uh, we want to uh, uh, examine the ability of rat to say that whether um, a sequence was in the right sequence or it was out of sequence. So they, um, as I said, they have basically um, uh, five orders, which we label them as A, B, C, D, E. This is the right order. Uh, order uh, for these five orders, but if, if, we show, if we show them, the rat should say, well, this is the right sequence. If we present A, B, A, D, E, then the rat should say there's something wrong here. And while the rat is doing this, as I said, there are two types of data collected, continuous time series, local field potentials, and um, the spike turns, this is the firing pattern of uh, uh, new ones. How does the rat say it exactly? I'll show you in a second. <laughs> It's very cute, actually. I'm going to show you. Um, so one important thing, because I'm going to come back to this. Um, so there are tetras that they basically collect the continuous uh, signal, uh, LFP. And then associated with each of that, there are like four wires that they detect the uh, nearby uh, neurons. Um, and then they, they basically measure the firing pattern of neurons. So there is a structure here. So there are uh, some tetras associated with uh, uh, that they collect LFP. Associated with each tetra, there are multiple neurons that we look at the uh, spiking pattern. So this is, um, this is one of the rats. Um, so it involves, as I said, like presenting uh, um, orders. And then uh, the rat has to, as you said, how it says it, um, if this is the right order, it has to stay there for more than a second. If it's not uh, the right uh, order, it has to withdraw right away before one second. So I'm going to show you a video. Um, actually, pr they're presenting four orders here in this video, but the same concept. There are like three trials, three uh, set of experiments. The first one is in the right order, and the rat gets it right. Um, the second one um, is out of sequence, and the rat gets it right. They said this doesn't seem right. The third one is in the r uh, wrong order, and the rat misses it. Okay, so three. Oh, the video is not, okay, okay. So, four orders, A, B, C, D, no performance error. Uh, 
And there is a reward. There is water coming uh, from down there to get a reward. So the second one is A, B, D, D. So it's out of sequence. So the rat should identify the third one is out of order. You see, it just pulled out right away. So it got the reward. So this one is A, B, A, D. So it's the wrong order, but the, there's a uh, performance error. Missed it. It stayed long. So it's confused. <laughs> What's happening here? So. Um, so um, this is the data. Uh, we are focusing on 218 of these trials. So each trial involves like presenting one um, order, and it lasts uh, somewhere between 0.48 to 1.74 seconds. And there are 12 tetros, so 12 LFP signals, and 52 neurons. As I said, there is a structure. Each LFP is related to multiple of these neurons. And the data looks like this. As I said, they're discrete time series, they're continuous time series, and uh, th these are the labels. Okay. So we were interested in, um, first of all, like there is an unsupervised learning uh, uh, problem here. Um, can we identify a low dimensional representation of these neurons? Because you have a multimodality and multidimensional uh, data, but can be presented in a low dimensional space? There's a supervised learning, this is what they care about, mostly decoding. If I just show you the uh, brain signals, can you tell me what order was presented? And can you tell me that whether this was in sequence order or out of sequence order? And there's a data integration because you have multiple data sources. How can we combine them properly? You might have done this, just putting the data together doesn't usually improve performance. Uh, you need a smart way to do that. And one thing that we were interested in uh, is replay. We want to see that if rat is thinking about this um, sequence when it's not doing the experiment, when it's relaxing, um, if we, because they continue measuring brain signals, can we see something like um, uh, signals related to A, B, C, D, E is happening? So the rat is memorizing like how we memorize when we have to prepare for something. Um, so as I said, we uh, started with um, Bayesian and stochastic process modeling. So we developed a, a, a non-parametric dynamic model for correlation of structure among LFP. So this is just a continuous time series. We have multiple of them. Um, we also developed a model for the discrete time series, uh, detecting synchronies among firing of these neurons. If one neuron is firing, whether the other one starts firing too or not. Um, and also we have a model for uh, joint uh, dimensionality reduction of uh, LFP and the spike uh, signals. So this is basically very quickly, this is um, the, the model we developed for continuous data. So you have LFP signals. This is an in-sequence trial. This is an out-sequence trial. These are the continuous uh, time series that I mentioned. And um, we developed the model like this, that it actually models the correlation of structure among these tetrodes, uh, these LFP signals dynamically, this is um, how it looks like for an in-sequence uh, for in sequence trials. This is how it looks like for out-of-sequence trials. And we can look at the distance between these two to see that, you know, like at some point, the two uh, correlation structures start to change. Um, we also have the dynamic model for a spike train. So these are a spike counts, so the bigger circle, there were more spiking activity for that neuron um, at that time. And um, we developed a model like this. It looks at the synchrony among uh, multiple neurons. So this is for uh, when order uh, A was presented. Uh, some weak correlation between neuron one and two. Nothing here. An interesting pattern, uh, uh, synchrony between neuron three and four. Just as a comparison, uh, when we looked at uh, these four neurons for order C, nothing was happening. They were kind of um, unrelated. And we also developed a a model for uh, a joint modeling of LFP and a spike. Um, so this is, uh, uh, I say component one, component two, I'm gonna show you autoencoder for people from uh, a neural network background. This would be the two neurons in a bottleneck, for example, of an autoencoder. So this is dimensionality reduction. In Bayesian uh, um, modeling, they call this 
latent uh, variables. So you have two latent variables, component one, component two. But you can think about this a low dimensional presentation um, of the orders. And as you can see, for order A, we'll see that it's very easy to distinguish. Um, um, and um, um, order B, C, and it gets more difficult uh, later on. And um, so it's very easy to see that whether order A was in sequence or out of sequence. But it gets more difficult as you go down there. Okay. So now in terms of inference, um, so um, because these are Bayesian model, we use Markov chain Monte Carlo. I have just one slide. Most people know what Markov chain Monte Carlo is. But you basically have a distribution that you want to approximate is, um, uh, is not tractable. Um, you design a dynamic system that moves over the space of the uh, parameter. So this is parameter theta. This is the, uh, spa uh, the parameter space. So this dynamic system moves around. So I have time here to show that how it moves around. But the time is fictitious. After we are done, we marginalize over time. And then we get the uh, histogram of uh, these locations that this dynamic system visited. And the histogram would approximate the, uh, the actual posterior distribution. So this is a uh, beta binomial uh, model. We know the, what the posterior would be analytically. Uh, but I wanted to show that MCMC works fine. Um, so the dynamic system can be designed in different ways. So you can basically now, again, like this is the parameter space. This is the posterior distribution. The dynamic system could be just a random walk over the parameter space. And um, as you can see, it doesn't work that well here. Um, it's kind of a stock uh, in this low uh, density area. It's been uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that we have been using. It explores the parameter space more efficiently um, because it defines a dynamic system that uh, has a potential energy, which is uh, the negative log uh, probability of the posterior distribution. And Q, it depends on Q, and Q is the parameter of interest. And there is a kinetic energy, which is a negative log probability of a Gaussian distribution, defined in terms of some parameters P, uh, which is called momentum. P is fictitious. We don't care about it. After we are done, we marginalize over it. And then the, um, this P uh, depends on uh, mat covariance matrix M, which is called the mass matrix. And and the uh, total energy of potential and kinetic is called Hamiltonian function, which is defined this way. If you uh, uh, look at the exponential of negative of this energy, it would take you back to the probability distribution. So we can write down the joint probability distribution of Q, which is what we are interested in, the parameter of interest, and uh, some uh, augmented uh, set of parameters P. But how do we make this work? Solving a system of differential equation like this, uh, which basically says how Q, which is the location parameter, the one that we are interested in, the location in the parameter space, um, how it changes over time, and how this momentum of the dynamic system uh, changes over time. As you can see, it depends on this gradient of this uh, Hamiltonian function, but the Hamiltonian function is de defined in terms of potential energy, which is, um, which is uh, um, basically uh, the main part of it is the uh, log likelihood. So it's very expensive to calculate. OK. So, so following the, uh, the work of Professor Amari, um, more recently, uh, Keller and Girolami, they basically said that mass matrix, that covariance matrix, which I said is fixed, um, they made it uh, position dependent, so, and then set it to Fisher information. And they called it uh, Riemannian. Uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So as you can see, it works better than the uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo because you look at the second order information. Look at, at, at Hessian plus the gradient. And uh, my student and I, we had uh, an, uh, another version of this. We call it Lagrangian Monte Carlo, uh, which works similarly but with much lower computational cost. OK, so this was just a sub. Now, um, how have been we have been using uh, deep learning? First, as I said, we have been using it uh, for both computation part and for the modeling part. For the computational part, which I call it um, inference here, um, using the uh, machine learning uh, terminology. So while HMC that you saw that it works better in terms of exploring the parameter space, um, 
it's very costly because it, you have to calculate this gradient function at each iteration. So that's, uh, that's very costly. So we have been using uh, uh, some methods to approximate the gradient function um, using neural networks, which they call it neural network surrogates. So, so um, you use it as an approximation of the log likelihood. Um, it's called it's like a surrogate for the log likelihood. So the first attempt that we did um, we had was um, basically th that energy function, which is again like negative log uh, uh, posterior probability, mainly negative log likelihood. So we wanted just to approximate that. Um, so if we approximate that, then the total energy would be this approximate potential energy plus the kinetic. This is not expensive to calculate. So it would, uh, the, and then you have a new Hamiltonian, which is approximate, uh, we call it H tilde. So we, for this, we use a neural network to approximate it. And it looks like this. So this is a simple example. This is what the uh, negative log probability looks like, the yeah, negative log likelihood. Um, and this is how the approximation looks like. Uh, again, like this is a simple problem, so it works fine. And after we uh, find u tilde as an approximation to u, then we can use its gradient as an approximation of the gradient of u. So we use the gradient of u tilde, as a, so we take the uh, gradient of u tilde and use it as an approximation for gradient of u. But gradient of energy, it has a name, it's called force. So this is the force map. So um, one set of arrows show the, uh, the, uh, the force map, the gradient uh, from the correct energy function. And other one, the approximation that we found. So for the most part, it's very similar. And the two methods um, are basically performing similarly. Uh, the standard HMC, this is the neural network surrogate that we have been using. Uh, they look the same, but this is much faster. Um, so uh, working with uh, Professor Baldi in, uh, in recent years, um, we have been developing some more uh, versions, uh, some more advanced versions of this. Uh, so one of the students uh, in Professor Baldi's lab um, is be has been developing, so directly approximating the gradient function. So we don't approximate the log likelihood and then taking a gradient and you know, like to find the approximation. We are using neural network to directly approximate the gradient function. Um, so that's basically um, what we have been using in terms of application um, for the computational part, for the inference. Um, but we also have been using deep learning methods um, more recently uh, for dimensionality reduction. Um, so this is unsupervised learning. Again, this is um, what we have, uh, um, we have recently developed in uh, with collaboration with Professor Baldi. So it's an autoencoder. Uh, the bottleneck is size 2, and then the hidden layers are of size 100. Um, and the input here is just the spike uh, data. This is just the first attempt we had at this. We're just using the spike data, the discrete uh, time series uh, part. So now if I just project the actual uh, the data, um, these neuronal activities, and these two-dimensional, the, the two bottlenecks. Um, so th the greens are in-sequence trials. The reds are um, out-of-sequence. They are more in-sequence than out-of-sequence. So over time, if I just move through this and look at the, this projection over time, for the most part, they are mixed up. Uh, you can distinguish in sequence and out of sequence. Right about now, so this is like a point. Uh, those are not milliseconds. Actually, I found out last. Those are, uh, there's an error, error here, this typo. These are seconds. So 300 milliseconds, uh, around 300 milliseconds, uh, more specifically around, can you see the color? So around um, 350 milliseconds, the two now you can distinguish the two sequences. And then they mix up again. So as, as the trial goes on, um, so you remember the roughly each trial is about a, se a second. As it goes on, then um, they look differently. OK. So um, this is how, over time, the, the, the autoencoder 
identifies these, uh, these patterns, these low dimensional representation. We did the same thing um, for uh, three orders, so order A, B, C. So A is black, blue is B, and the, the other one is C. We found a similar pattern, again, as you go over time. Um, they are mixed up, it's hard to say. And as you get about here, now you kind of have a clear separation of A, B, and C. And then they, they mix up again. So something happens in brain, and uh, it, it makes a decision around like a 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and, uh, and then it mixes up. So that's again like uh, how these patterns change over time. And then, as I said, like the main uh, motivation for this was uh, doing uh, decoding. Um, so basic, basically, um, looking at uh, a neural set of neural activities, both continuous time series and discrete time series, and um, see whether we can um, whether we can say what order was presented. As a baseline, we just started with the multinomial logic model. It's always a good exercise. To, to see that how a simple model would perform. So we have a spike data. We basically did, uh, um, looked at the average of counts over, um, over time, and we had some LFP. We looked at the uh, wavelet coefficients, um, and then we combined them together and fit it into a multinomial logic model. So this would be our baseline. But in convolutional neural networks, um, I was convinced that this would be a good um, application of for convolutional neural networks uh, to process the data because as much as in the, in the image people care about uh, location invariance, um, here uh, we can treat each um, uh, set of brain signals and treat it as an image. And, um, and then we also here care about time invariance because we think that uh, you know, like from trial to the trial, there would be some uh, minor shifts in patterns, and we want uh, the, uh, the the network to detect that. Um, so we use um, a set of filters. Um, each filter applied to be divided the time uh, into time bins, and we uh, so we had n time bins, and then we use n filters. The filters goes over these time bins by a time. Uh, so the the features that we get out of these. Uh, would be n filter times n beans uh, matrix um, of the uh, convolution, uh, the output of convolution filter. And then we just do the pooling um, over time. And then so you are done with um, basically a vector of um, n filter. So this would be the output after pooling. Um, we tried this. It didn't work that much. What it made it work was this idea um, that we, um, after talking to our collaborator, is that we should look at each, uh, if you remember, there was a structure here. We said that there are tetrodes and associated with each tetrod, uh, each tetrod collects the, the continuous time series LFP data, and associated with that, there are multiple signals. So we said that we should do the convolution tetrod-wise. So for each tetrod, we do the convolution. So this is basically what you see from one tetrod. You see the LFP data, the continuous, and corresponding to that, you see multiple of neurons over time and their uh, um, their spiking activity. So we did the convolution tetrod-wise, uh, basically the same thing that I said before, uh, but for each tetrod separately. We got a pooled feature for one tetrod. Uh, we did it for another tetrod and another one. And we had like these pooled features from different tetrods that we put them together and fit it to a, a hidden layer. And then this, then this started working. So this is the result. Um, if you just use multinomial log uh, logistic model and just use on a spike data only, uh, we get 65% accuracy rate on five orders, not bad. Um, if you use convolutional neural networks, we get about the same thing. Uh, so there was no improvement here. But this tetrodwise convolution idea, uh, it made the performance much better. As you can see, for multinomial logic, combining LFP and a spike doesn't improve because LFP is very noisy signal. It masks the signals that you get from the, the uh, spike trains, the spiking patterns. But uh, combining LFP and a spike within a convolutional neural network improved the prediction accuracy from 65% to 70%. And uh, this is the uh, breakdown 
um, for uh, the confusion matrix for A, B, C, D. As you can see, A does a great job, B, C, but then it gets to D and E, it confuses them uh, with C for the most part. Um, so in conclusion, so um, this is a very interesting data set. It's a very unique data set, created a rich, uh, provide us with a rich set of data uh, that we can uh, analyze and examine the neural basis of non-spatial. Again, like it's very important to make this non-spatial uh, experiment. So non-spatial memory task, because that corresponds to human being very well. Um, we previously used uh, Bayesian and stochastic process models for a spike NLFP um, and use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo for inference. And recently we used uh, deep learning to improve both decoding and also a scale up uh, computation. So for us, it, uh, it's been used for both aspects of our work. And um, there, as you remember, one of our objective was to see that whether these patterns are repeated when the rat is not doing uh, the experiment, um, basically to see that whether there is, there is sequence reactivation. Um, this is uh, still something that we are working on. And also, I'm personally interested to uh, explore this connection between uh, Bayesian and stochastic process modeling and deep learning. As I said, there are a couple of recent papers on this, but I think that this still is a very interesting area of research. And um, these are my collaborators. So uh, uh, Professor Porten uh, is the, uh, the neuroscientist who, have, who designed the experiment and collected the data. Professor Rombao is a statistician expert in time series, my colleague at UCI. And Professor Baldi, who uh, has been great working with him. We, uh, uh, some of his students help us with the deep learning uh, part of this project. And our postdocs and the students and uh, founding sources Thank you so much. Thank you. So perhaps we have a, a time for one quick question. So I have uh, one question. So th this is our task for discriminating in sample, in, in sequence and out uh, sequence. Is it possible for a uh, rat to learn that the order of the sequence? Is it order? Yeah. There just mm, maybe the, uh, A, B, C, D, for yeah. example, the yes. B, C, A, D, or <laughs> the order yes. of the sequence. Is it possible to, for is a rat, it what, sorry? For can rat learn the order of the sequence also? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the, uh -huh. yeah there are, no, it's both of them, actually, in sequence, out okay. of sequence, and also understanding A comes first, B, okay, second, I see. C, and so, yeah, both of them, sorry if it wasn't clear. Both of them, um, mm -hmm. we are interested both in seeing that whether it finds out whether this is in sequence or out of sequence, but they memorize actually this um, order, order. No, okay, yeah, A, B, C, D, E, and, uh, and uh, um, some of them uh, do a good job actually going through the experiment. So we mm -hmm. have, one of them is called Super Chris. We have like very high quality data coming from him. And some of them, they don't get it. So uh, the quality of data is not that good. Okay. Yeah. Pardon? How big is your training how many So uh, the training data, so there is one data point at each millisecond. So and then this is a goal, like uh, the experiment is one second, but they start recording throughout the whole process. Um, so it's a huge time series. So the, the, the time is like, uh, the time dimension is it's a big data. And then uh, there are, uh, as I said, like a 128, you know, like a, a trial. And then for each of them, you have 12 uh, uh, LFP data and 52 neurons. And then you have multiple rats. So it just adds up very quickly. OK, then let's thank the speaker again. Okay.